Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the book release celebration for Barry Devlin's latest book, Cloud Data Warehousing, Volume 1. I am Steve Hoberman, the director for Technix Publications. And we do these book release celebrations for three main reasons. The first reason is a little bit selfish. It's kind of, I love to show off our books. Technix Publications publishes the best books on data. We actually have over 150 titles on data and including Barry Devlin's first book, Business on Intelligence, and now his latest book, Cloud Data Warehousing, Volume One. I also love to show off our authors. I'm continuously in awe of our authors. We have the most amazing authors in the industry, including Barry Devlin. Barry has helped shape the data warehousing industry. He is one of the um, founders, actually, of data warehousing back in the 1980s and has a very rich history in data management. And I'll let Barry talk a bit more about that in just a minute. Second reason for these celebrations is, well, to celebrate. To celebrate. We acknowledge that writing a book is an incredible amount of effort and putting 30,000 words or 50,000 words or 100,000 words down and thinking of a very concise way to explain ideas is an incredible feat. And we're here to celebrate that as well. And the third is really the key messages. What's in the book and specifically, why do you write the book? So why do you write the book? Barry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why did you write this book? Thanks, Steve. Um, it's a good question, and I'm going to. It's going to take me a few slides to answer that. Uh, but first, you, you said I should introduce myself a little bit more than you had, so let me just do that. Um, so I'm Barry Devlin. For those of you who know me, indeed, I'm Barry Devlin. For those of you who don't, um, and in fact, um, I have been around this industry for probably forty years. Uh, first with IBM until 2008. I was in the software industry, in the uh, professional services industry, the consulting industry with IBM. And in 2008, I went out on my own and, and founded uh, Ninesight Consulting. Um, and I was being an independent consultant and analyst in the areas of data and information, data and information management, all aspects of things, information and data since then. And in the in the last year or so, I've um, I've also uh, signed up, joined up with uh, the Met Office in the UK uh, part time. Um, the Met Office is the uh, meteorological service of the UK, one of the main uh, meteorological services in the world, actually. And um, going through the process of um, in introducing a huge new uh, cloud-based supercomputer, which is not anything that I have to do with, but it's a huge background to the work that I'm doing there. But I'm continuing to do a little bit of analyst type of work and write this book, um, which is which is where we are. So if, if we could go to the next slide then, I would like to uh, just talk to you a little bit about um, the... Uh, the reason for why I've written the book. And I'm not seeing the slide moving. So next slide, please. There we go. Okay. So I I need to drag you back to the to the 1980s. And that's why I use this, this background from back to the future. One reason is that my reason for writing this book goes all the way back to the 1980s. Um, I didn't know back then that I was going to write this book, but it certainly was part of the uh, the reason. Um, and back in the 1980s, some of you may recall that, um, well, we had great technology. Um, there's a, a smartphone. Well, it's a dumb phone in the middle of this in this in the middle of this picture. Uh, it was affectionately known as the brick, but it was one of the first mobile phones that were around at the time. And of course, you'll recognize the IBM PC with wow two five and a quarter inch floppy disk drives, which was uh, a huge step forward from the single floppy disk drive that it used to have. And on the right hand side, uh, Teradata's DBC 1012, which was actually one of, or probably the first database machine specifically designed for uh, handling management information. 
it was so expensive that probably nobody could fill all the racks and all of the spaces for disc in it because hardware was so expensive in those days. But it was, in a way, from a technology point of view, the start of the data warehousing era. And next slide, please. Um, the part of the move into data warehousing era that I was part of was, was this architecture picture, which, um, which the piece of work that was based on actually to start, started back in 1986. Um, back then, as I said, I worked for IBM and um, IBM was there at that time looking for a way to understand in a consistent and integrated way uh, its business. What was it selling? What were the sales of the different parts of the business, the mainframe business, the mid-range business, and indeed the PC business that we just mentioned. And they're very different businesses. And the data that was coming in from the salespeople was all over the place. So IBM couldn't understand whether they were making a profit or not. So that's the original uh, driver for data warehousing. It was consistent, reconciled data for decision-making reporting in business terms. And because relational technology was new then, it was based on relational technology and SQL. And the picture on the right-hand side of the screen is from the first, uh, that I know of, the first published uh, data warehouse architecture. And that was published in 1988 by myself and a colleague, Paul Murphy. And it was published in the IBM Systems Journal. Those of you who can look at a little bit closely, maybe you've got better eyesight than I have, will probably see that that picture and the one beside it are the pictures that we've used very much exclusively and continuously through much of the era of data warehousing. And sorry, Steve, I hate to tell you, there was a book before I published with you. Back in 1997, I published a data warehouse from architecture to implementation. Before that, Bill Inmon came out with his Building the Data Warehouse book, and that was in 1992. And I think it's probably fair to say that that was based pretty much on the IBM Systems Journal paper that came out a few years earlier. So what happened after that? On the next slide, please. The history of the data warehousing environment the first 25 years, as I look down this list, what you will see again and again and again is too difficult, too slow, too small, too structured, too focused, too hard to do. And essentially over the first 25 years of data warehousing, what you would see would be people trying to figure out how to overcome the, the implementation issues of what was a very advanced and uh, future-like architecture that I had written up and published in 1988. Too difficult to build. Yeah, it's, we're trying to bring data across into a central location from many different sources. No, no let's not do that. Let's do data marts. Um, or we haven't got enough space for big data. This was by the 2000s. Oh, yeah, let's get rid of the data warehouse. Let's do Hadoop. By 2010, no, data scientists need something more flexible and more structured. Let's do a data lake. So back in 2013, when I did publish the first book with Steve called Business Unintelligence, what I was really trying to do was to create some thinking in the industry about um, what data warehousing was really about, what information really is about. And I really was trying to create a new architecture that could cover not just the early types of data that were involved in data warehousing, but also big data and also the data that's required for analytics and for, 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 um, for data science. And so that was a, a very big um, piece of work. And I just, if you go to the next slide, please, just want to show you a tiny bit of what that um, what that picture looks like. So that book produced two architectural pictures, a conceptual architecture, which I called ideal, and a logical architecture, which I called real. Um, and those pictures are really trying to say 
What is it we're trying to do? Well, the conceptual architecture picture says that we are trying to create a system by which people process information. And we use, I use this idea of thinking spaces to try to help people to construct a mental model of what it is that they wanted to do. The logical architecture, which is essentially about building the, the environment used by IT, for example, showed that there were three different pillars or types of information and data, but they needed to be interconnected. They needed to work together. And that's why there's this thing called context setting information, which I think of as metadata plus plus stretched across the middle of this here to enable us to link these things together and to make them work together. So we have these different types of information all within the same architecture. We have a way of feeding events and measures and messages, which is the real world stuff into it, that's called instantiation. And we have a number of other pieces of functionality around these three types of information and data to make it all work together. And I think that was a really important, well, I would, it was my book. I think it was a really important um, way of looking, and, uh, looking at this whole world of data and information in a new way. And that was, as I say, back in 2013. Uh, next slide, please. Back in 2013, I was still an independent consultant, um, and I really didn't have in my uh, ability to push uh, this architecture out as far as I would have liked to. But of course, there are lots of people who took it up and ran with it. And I'm very pleased that some of them at least signed up for this, for this uh, celebration. And I'd like to thank them for their support over the years as, as we looked at all of the issues and, um, and challenges and opportunities of managing information together. And um, yeah, the stuff that's in here, in that book, and indeed in Cloud Data Warehousing, which comes from my conversation with those clever people. So moving on after the publication of Business on Intelligence, well, there was another set of uh, deaths of the data warehouse. Oh, it's too centralized. Oh, it's too limited in scope. Oh, it's too difficult to build and manage. Every one of these two, two XYZ statements has been associated with, uh, and this is the death of the data warehouse. Well, to, to quote uh, Mark Twain, um, news of my death has been greatly exaggerated because data warehouse has continued and continued and continued to live. So why write cloud data warehousing? Well, actually this year is the 35th anniversary of the publication of the first data warehouse architecture. And I think that's worth a bit of a celebration in itself. Also, I think it's fair to say that um, some things have changed. And what's really changed, of course, is the emergence of cloud. And I know cloud has been coming since, has been coming for many, many years. But I suppose, in my view at least, it is really only in the last few years that it has become a valid and a viable uh, place where you could really think about uh, doing full scale data warehousing in the way that I think about it. So Cloud Data Warehousing Volume 1, published a couple of months ago, thanks, Steve, um, is essentially um, my repost to this history of saying data warehousing is dead. Because what I think it, it has happened is that what we've got is a whole set of new terminology data meshes and lake houses and fabrics and things, which are essentially just another variation, a ver another variant of data warehousing. So to, to do my best French impression, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Everything may change, but everything remains the same. And I just wanted to use this opportunity with Cloud Data Warehousing Volumes 1 and 2 to try to um, bookend the, um, this evolution, this history. And um, after volume two, I'm probably not gonna write another book. 
And I know all authors say that, Steve, but I really mean it. Um, so if we move on to the, <clears throat> excuse me, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, this is one uh, point or one part of the in contents of, of Cloud Data Warehousing Volume 1, which I'm going to spend the rest of this, this little talk uh, just discussing some of, the, some of the pieces there. So this is the architecture for Cloud Data Warehousing. If you look to the center in the blue pillars, you'll see some things have changed. And you, unless you're familiar with the original picture, you may find it difficult to see this. Um, but if you look towards the bottom of the pillars, you'll notice that they're all joined together at the base. Previously, they were separate. And this joining together is a reflection of the um, implications of the new forms of object storage and the, the uh, formats and systems built upon object storage that is now available in the cloud. Because object storage really does provide an added opportunity to share and reuse data of different types. So when I looked back at these pillars in 2013, the cloud was still around, but it wasn't as powerful. Um, I very much said that we probably had to have different technologies for machine generated data, for process mediated data, which is where warehouses live, and human sourced information. Think of social media and so on. I felt the need for, for, in, for very different technology bases. And um, essentially with the emergence of object storage and the ability to put um, data in object storage in different ways and the uh, amount of metadata that you can, if you like, associate with the data in object storage, I think we have a much larger opportunity to start building um, data warehousing, um, reporting, analytics, BI, um, AI, all of those things on the same set of data. Now you'll see that the pillars remain separate as we move further up, which is suggesting that we can't do everything in object storage. I mean, there are some things where we do want to optimize for a particular way of, of processing data. And we may need to, for instance, use graph databases, or we might have to do a very specific type of um, structure in order to do some type of AI analytics. Um, I don't know, but I want to enable our our developers, our implementers, to build commonly on object storage where possible, and but to also um, use other types of technologies where necessary. So that's one change within the architecture. The second change, as you may, may notice, is that there are multiple information planes. Uh, you can just barely see that second plane peeping out from behind the front ones. And these multiple information planes, they represent the fact that we're in a multi-cloud, hybrid, on-premises uh, environment. So we may have data warehouses spread across multi-cloud environments and hybrid on-premises environments. So it's important to be able to represent that. And the other change that I've made to the architecture is basically to emphasize the positioning and the role of the people aspect. That's taking that green box from our uh, thinking space in the ideal architecture and emphasizing where it sits there. Also, its role as a source of messages. One point that I, I, I've always emphasized, and it's never been obvious in the logical architecture, but I've always said it. So I wanted to to emphasize it in visual terms here, is that this is all around people. This is all about what we deliver to people to make decisions and to take actions. So it made some sense to me to really put that people box at the top, but it's not actually a change in the architecture. So what I would say in summary is that what I discovered, and I wasn't too surprised, um, was that the 2013 architecture developed without really much consideration for cloud data warehousing or indeed cloud at all, actually trans transformed and transmitted reasonably accurately with minimal change 
to the cloud environment. So it's not about doing something entirely new. It's more about being able to uh, make allowances for what new technologies and what new indeed problems and issues that cloud presents to us. So that's the architecture. Uh, next slide, please. What I also then wanted to talk about was this um, environment where we have now these new memes. Um, the new memes for the 2020s, we've seen them emerge in 19, 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, data fabric, data lakehouse, and data mesh. And what I'm going to say to you up front is that I believe that these are simply variants, new variants of cloud data warehousing. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I'm just getting a message. I think I'll leave questions to the end if that's okay. Um, so, uh, in order to talk about and discuss these different uh, memes from the 2020s, I've started talking about a term that I call architectural design patterns. Now, what is an architectural design pattern? Well, we know what an architecture is at a certain level. It's, it's these pictures that we use to describe in broad terms what it is that we're trying to build. And what I've discovered as I've looked through all of the different uh, pieces of the technology that we use and the systems that we use is that we need a sort of a lower level down from the architecture, the logical archi architecture that you've just seen. A picture that gives you a little bit more of what's going on. So an architectural design pattern is a set of agreed terminology and a high level picture or two um, that encapsulates the key business needs and the fundamental infrastructure requirements and constraints of a solution approach. And what I would like to propose as a way of thinking is that there are currently three foundational patterns that underpin all of our thinking about analytics and decision-making support today. Those three patterns are data warehouse classic, and it comes in two flavors, on-premises and cloud native. But Data Warehouse Classic, what I've talked about and what we've known and loved since the 80s. Data Lake Classic, the very basic data lake that was introduced in 2010 or 11, um, and was basically an idea of dumping everything in, the, in a certain way with, uh, without, um, without much pre-processing. And the logical data warehouse, the third foundational pattern, which is a combination of a lake, uh, sorry, a warehouse, a data warehouse with access to other sources of information around it or underneath it uh, in real time. And this logical data warehouse is a very powerful and interesting pattern, which probably emerged in the 2010s as well. So those three foundational patterns are what I would believe is worth thinking about. Um, and there are three emergent patterns, and I'm not going to change the names in any way. It's what I've told you before. It's Lakehouse, Fabric, and Mesh. And essentially what we're trying to do in cloud data warehousing is to figure out how we're going to take the journey to the cloud from the foundational patterns, which many of us already have, to the um, emergent patterns um, of the current uh, uh, and emerging future. Um, okay, so let's have a quick look at those three patterns. Um, and if I ha could have the next slide, please. Um, the first pattern that we're going to uh, look at here is the, um, is the data lake house. Um, now, I'm not going to give you the answers to what are the uh, architectural design patterns for each of these uh, three memes. I'm going to just share with you uh, what they are in a broad sense and maybe a, a hint of my opinion about them. Um, you need to wait for volume two when I'll be doing more of the work and doing more of the um, deep, deep dives 
into these patterns. Um, so Data Lakehouse, introduced and popularized by Databricks in early 2020. And what they say is essentially, well, we take uh, the idea of a data warehouse and we take the idea of a data lake, we take the best of both worlds and we uh, push them together. And that is probably a pretty good description as far as it goes. Um, what they probably don't mention is that they also take the worst of both worlds and they get pushed together as well. So there's some pros and cons to this pattern as there is to every other pattern. And the way I would see it is that in simple terms, Data Lakehouse is about taking the technology that emerged with the data lake, uh, the technology that is um, that migrated much, very much to the cloud during the evolution of the data lake. Um, that technology like object storage, streaming, all of those things that we did as data lakes became available and to overlay that with the um, essentially data management aspects of the data warehouse. And I would say the data management aspects um, are probably, in my view, more important than the technology aspects for a data warehouse or indeed a data lake house. So in many respects, this data lake house is more of a warehouse than a lake. Um, if you look at it through the lens of somebody who is trying to build something. It's also perhaps interesting to note that um, because of the, I suppose, the heritage of the data bricks people who, who introduced this pattern, the data warehouse background in this is a data warehouse which was fed from external data more than from the traditional um, operational systems of the um, of the old world, the legacy world, we should say, and and therefore the focus has been much more on these asset transactions and making the streaming more reliable, and not so much the focus on how do we deal with the reconciliation of batches of data coming in from uh, our operational systems. I'm not going to say more than that. A lot of interesting things in Data Lakehouse, a uh, lot of things that we need to talk about and that we will talk about in volume two. Um, and now we move to the data um, fabric. In the data fabric, I think what I see here, this was, well, it, actually Forrester was describing it as far back as 2013, but is now being very strongly promoted by Gartner and has been adopted by multiple vendors. The Bottom line for Data Fabric is that it's a distributed data management platform. And the way I see it is that when I look at Data Fabric, I see Logical Data Warehouse. Logical Data Warehouse that has been automated, that has been um, made more easy to manage, that has taken AI on top of it to activate the metadata, to make it live metadata and uh, enable us to use the metadata to do dynamic data integration. So in a way, Data Fabric is the logical data warehouse meeting AI. And in that sense, that's a very interesting approach because I believe logical data warehouse was probably one of the um, more important aspects of building data warehouses that could get a data everywhere um, as opposed to just data in the relational database. And I think logical, uh, sorry, data fabric extends and builds upon that idea of logical data warehouse and can really help us to do um, a better job of integrating data where it exists in many different locations. Um, on the next slide, um, we have uh, data mesh. Now, Data Mesh is uh, something that um, was um, introduced by Jamak Dagani of ThoughtWorks in the latter part of 2019. And as it definitely has become the talking point of the data warehousing uh, world. Um, the description below, um, a domain-driven analytical data architecture, data as a product um, owned by, intimately known by and consumed by the business people, all of these are great ideas and are a very interesting approach 
to and a very different approach to data warehousing. Because essentially the bottom line, I think, about data mesh is first, well, two, let's do two bottom lines. One is that um, we don't like centralized. Centralized anything is not a good thing as far as data mesh is concerned. So decentralization distributed is really the way that data mesh goes. And that's a very, very big change from data warehousing as it has existed for nearly 40 years. Uh, the other thing, the other bottom line is this focus on governance, a federated governance in this case, but this focus on governance, very interesting and very important aspect of data mesh. But because we're moving from a, to a very different technology, a distributed technology, set of technologies, as opposed to a centralized approach, this is a big step. I think this is a very big step for any organization. And I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is that as data mesh, as people have tried it, they're beginning to see that it's not as easy as it sounds to get there. So that's a very quick uh, overview of those three systems, of those three approaches. On the next slide, just a little um, a teaser, if I could say. The next slide shows a little teaser of, the, um, of two of these architectural design patterns. On the left, you see the classic uh, Data Warehouse Classic, or DWC. And what you'll see in the middle of that is the, the pillars of the logical architecture, some of them emphasize more than others. And the fact that if you look into, the, into, that, uh, into that pattern, that there is this data warehouse block, which takes up a huge part of the uh, process mediated data pillar. But we also have to recognize that there are separate, independent, standalone, if you like, operational systems. The picture on the right-hand side is a very early draft of Data Lakehouse. In fact, I was working on it this week and I've changed it significantly. So please don't, uh, please don't go any further with this. I haven't had a chance to change the slides. Next slide, please. I'd like to begin to wrap up. Um, and um, what I would like to just sort of point out to you at this stage is, yeah, data, Cloud Data Warehousing Volume 1, which is available now, and I've got some links there from, uh, for, for getting it from Technix um, with a discount of 25%. Um, Cloud Data Warehousing Volume 1 is really about exploring the architectural and system foundations for these three um, uh, patterns that were, are emerging, the lake house, the fabric, and the data mesh, as well as what I think of as the base cloud data warehouse pattern. It's trying to answer the questions of why are there so many options and approaches? What is different about them? Might one of them be a better approach than, approach than another, and why? And how would we get from where we are today to uh, where we want to go in the future? Volume two, which is hopefully coming out in the second quarter of next year, um, is called Implementing the Three, Four Things that we've already mentioned, and is obviously a deeper dive into those architectural patterns. So um, if you'll, if we can just, oh, sorry, we just mentioned that I am doing a, a virtual event uh, on November the 1st to the 3rd. Um, it's uh, in the mornings, um, European time. It's called Untangling Data Mesh, Fabric and Lakehouse. And you can find it at adaptevents.nl. Um, if we go to the final slide, I just want to say to you, thank you. It's been a pleasure, always a pleasure talking to you folks and, and, and seeing your comments, which I'm going to come to in a moment. Um, and uh, suggest to you that there are any questions uh, that we would like to deal with. Let's go through them and see. Now I have to put on my glasses. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, let's go through these questions. Um, um, can I see all of the questions? Uh, yes. Cloud Ob Tony Bear is saying cloud object storage is the great leveler. Yeah, I think that is a, it's not a question. It's a good comment and I think it's a good point. Um, um, and Tony's also adding in workload isolation and elasticity. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's taken me a while, I have to say, to recognize the power of the um, 
object storage and indeed the table format stuff, the open format, uh, open table format stuff that are on top of that. And um, the way that that is enabling us to do different things with data that we couldn't do before. So yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, somebody likes the architectural design patterns. Um, uh, Charles, architectural design patterns, reusable joins, filters, traceable lineage, usage descriptors. Not sure I understand what the question is there. Um, maybe Charles will like to add a little bit more to the to the feed. Uh, I certainly can't answer the question. Is are the slides available? Uh, Steve, can we make the slides available? Well, I'm happy to do so. So the answer to that question is yes. Um, any other questions coming in? Charles, we're waiting for you. Architecture. Now, really, now I'm, I'm intrigued by your question. Reusable joins, filters, traceable lineage, usage descriptors. Okay, I think we'll take that. Send me an email. Send me an email if you really want to d dive into it. Barry at ninesight.com and I will certainly try to answer that for you. Now I can take off my glasses, which are probably shining in the light. <laughs> um, it's been a, a pleasure to be here and to talk to you folks. Steve, do you have any last words that yeah. you want, want thank to Thank you, add? Barry. I always love hearing you speak, present, and um, thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll conclude here. Okay. Thanks. Steve, you promised drink. I'm sorry? Steve, you promised drink. <laughs> How about just water? Water works just fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody, oh, Charles, can I give a deeper description of the definition of architectural design patterns? Um, okay. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create as a common language that people can use when we talk about the same thing. So I've noticed over the years as I've gone to, to, to customers that I, every customer I goes to says, I've got a data warehouse. And then when they describe it, it's different from the last one I've spoken to. So I, as a consultant, can deal with that. But when you want to have a discussion among a group of people, um, who are coming at things from different areas, when you want to write a book, when you want to give a course, what you really have to try to do is to, is to provide a common language. So I see these architectural uh, design patterns as a common language. So for the course of the book or for the course of our course, hmm, that didn't come out well, uh, for the duration of our course, uh, we agree that we're going to use these terms to use these, to mean these things. So it says, here's the business problem we're trying to solve. Here is the sort of uh, the underpinning technical uh, and technology features that are important to this that we're going to use. Here are the things that are going to be uh, inhibitors to what we want to do. And if we can get all of that into a paragraph and put a picture beside it, that to me is an architectural design pattern. And it's a bit like, I suppose it's a bit like data modeling where you start off and you say, what I really mean when I say customer is. When I, when I talk about data lakehouse, this is exactly what I mean. Because if you look at what's out there, there are many different definitions of lakehouse, of fabric, of mesh. Go to any vendor you like and you'll get different definitions. So it's a way of, if you like, um, normalizing the vocabulary. Uh, being, thank you, um, whoever said that, that I've been a great mentor. Um, uh, what about Data Lake and its related processing costs? <laughs> That's a deep dive question. Um, I think there are going to be, I think Data Warehouse always has significant processing costs. Um, I don't have an answer at this stage about whether Data Lake is, is, is better or, or worse than anything else, um, I'd be unwilling to go down that, that particular path just now. Um, okay, I think we should wrap it there, Steve. Um, 
Sounds as great. We tried already. As soon as we said we're stopping, people came in with more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll see you at the next book release. Take care. Thanks, Cloud Data Warehousing Volume 2. <laughs>